Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz. I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of the CG Signature Lecture Series. Thanks also to you for joining us at this event, whether you're here as part of the live audience or if you're watching online through the live webcast. Following this evening's address, we welcome questions from both audiences at the microphones here at the front of the auditorium or through the live chat function on your screen if you're watching at home. Please remember to state your name and to keep the questions brief. Now, there are people who accept trends and there are people who direct them. Those are the innovators. And just last month, the Capital Institute, a think tank based in Connecticut, released a paper called Regenerative Capitalism, How Universal Principles and Patterns Will Shape Our New Economy. The paper investigates how the unsustainable capitalism of today can be turned into a network of regenerative economies that contribute to the overall health of the world economy. Tonight, founder and president of the Capital Institute, John Fullerton, will speak to us about this imagined, reimagined capitalism. And here to more properly introduce tonight's speaker is CG Senior Fellow Olaf Weber. Olaf joined CG's Global Economy Program in March of this year. He's an Associate Professor and Program Director in the University of Waterloo School of Environment, Enterprise and Development. So please join me in now in welcoming Olaf Weber. Thank you, Fred, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm more than happy to introduce John Fullerton today, the founder of and president of Capital Institute. I think John is an ec economy thought leader and public speaker. He is also an active impact investor uh, through his level three capital advisors, and I'm sure that he will explain what impact investing is. Um, amongst others, he's investing in, in a sustainable bank, in sustainable farming, water management, and so on. Uh, previously, he was a managing director of JP Morgan, where he managed multiple capital market and derivatives business around the globe and ran the venture investment activity of Lab Morgan as a chief investment officer. Furthermore, and in, in recent times, he is a co founder and director of Grasslands LLC, a holistic ranch management company, a director of New Day Farms, New Economy Act Coalition. Savoy Institute and an advisor to Armonia and, and Richard Branson's business leader in initiative B team. And recently he became a full member of the Club of Rome. John is the creator of the Future Finance blog at capitalinstitute.org, which is also syndicated with The Guardian, Huffington Post, CSR Wire, and other well-known publishers. He has appeared on Frontline, has been interviewed by New York Times, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journals, and many more. John has an MBA in finance from Stern School at New York University and a BA in economics from the University of Michigan. As Fred mentioned, John will speak about reimagining capitalism. He's calling for a shift to the next states of capitalism that operates from a deeper mission than mere financial profitability. The new goal is promoting the long-term health, the well-being of our human communities, and the planet. I would say sustainable development. In, in his presentation, John will explore the eight key principles of a regenerative economy and will share solutions with us that are currently being applied um, by real world businesses. I'm looking forward to hear more about regenerating capitalism and the new role, especially of the financial sector. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our speaker, John Fullerton. Good evening, and thank you, Olaf, uh, for that introduction. And um, in particular, I wanted to, to thank CG for this opportunity, and, and in particular to Tad for, uh, for making this happen. Um, I met Tad several years ago at an INET conference, which was actually, I believe, when INET and CG first forged a partnership. So uh, while this is my first time at CG and my first time in, in Waterloo, I sort of feel connected to, um, uh, to what you're doing here. You know, the, um, uh, well, actually, I have to comment on the, the, the preview. I, I sort of felt like we should be passing out popcorn. It was quite, a, uh, quite, a, uh, quite an opening. Um, I came into town um, just yesterday, 
and staying at the hotel across the street and noticed the, all of the construction happening. And, um, and really, it, it reminded me of a recent trip I made to China. And so, uh, with all the construction and high rises and cranes, uh, Waterloo, while not that well known in the United States, must be a, a, booming, a booming town. And, and uh, so, at any rate, it's, it's great to be with you all tonight. You know, I kind of stumbled into this question um, of, of how to rethink capitalism really somewhat by accident. Um, and, and I thought I'd take you back a little bit to my former life at J.P. Morgan. Uh, and I always like to say in, in meetings like this, it was really the old J.P. Morgan that I worked for. I, I went there right out of college in 1982. The bank was then called Morgan Guarantee Trust Company, which is a very prestigious bank, um, high ethical standards. And, um, and, and quite different than the J.P. Morgan we know to, today in, in many ways, um, mostly the scale of, of the firm. And I worked there very happily for 18 years. Uh, I, I have to put it out on the table. I was a derivatives professional in the early days of derivatives. Uh, back in the 80s, I was the first uh, head of, I, was, I, was, I moved to Tokyo when the first yen interest rate swap happened on planet Earth. And uh, going to Tokyo to do work in swaps when that happens is, is sort of fortuitous timing. And so I really rode the wave of uh, derivatives revolutionizing uh, global capital markets for the next 10, 12 years of my career. And then I kind of got tired of the markets and the um, increasingly sort of highly competitive nature of capital markets. The creativity had, had largely been gone, I thought. Um, and uh, so I wanted to learn how to invest capital. So I moved into our private investment group called Morgan Capital and, um, and basically stayed there until the merger with Chase, uh, investing money on behalf of the bank in early stage companies. Uh, and when the merger with Chase happened, it was kind of my excuse to walk away. I had been growing increasingly restless, but I had been involved in this idea of impact investing. Uh, the first investment I made for the bank was in the, uh, in a company called Edison Schools, which was a charter school management company. So I had this idea of aligning capital with social purpose back in 1997, long before uh, this concept of impact investing happened. Um, but, but things were moving fast on Wall Street and the, the, the culture of the firm that I kind of grew up in and learned to love was already fading in the face of highly competitive capital markets. Um, and with the merger with Chase, it became clear that the Chase culture was going to dominate um, the, the new Morgan. You know, Chase kept the name Morgan, but the reality was that they bought the bank. And so um, I, cho I chose that opportunity to leave with no real plan on, on where to head and no knowledge of the ecological crises that we're now uh, wrestling with. And I took the summer off. Uh, my first day back downtown after taking the summer off, I was going to visit a, a um, CEO of a charter school management company. I was thinking about getting involved further in that area. And it was a beautiful fall day. Uh, I was riding down the subway. I had a 9.30 meeting downtown. And at, at City Hall, which is where uh, the Brooklyn Bridge comes in, if you're familiar with Lower Manhattan, uh, this guy comes in the subway. And I can still visualize his picture like it happened yesterday. And he, he announced to us in the train, they just flew a pla plane into the Trade Center. And so I left and went up to the street, and the second plane had just hit. And I stood there for probably a half hour trying to figure out what was happening and what I might be able to do. And then I decided I'd better get home, and it took me the rest of the day to get home. And when I got home, I, have, I had three what were then quite young children. And I remember, again, very viscerally looking them in the eye and not knowing how to explain to them the world that they were going to grow up in. So I think that the combination of having some free time and that experience pushed me into a fairly deep think period in my life, and I started reading books, and I started learning about the environmental crisis in a way that I had previously no appreciation, no knowledge. Um, and I read Limits to Growth, and I read E.F. Schumacher and Herman Daly, and, um, and it was sort of this rolling epiphany that I realized that it was the economic system that was the root cause of the ecological crisis, and now it's quite apparent that the, ecological syst or that the economic system is also at the root of our many social crises. And as a finance person, it became very clear to me that since finance drives economics and the economy, it was finance that was at the root of many of these interconnected systemic crises. And that, as you can imagine, um, 
causes one some pause. And, um, and so I, I chose to sort of pour myself into this question of how to rethink the economy. Um, and it was only really after the financial crisis that I had the confidence to launch Capital Institute, which is, unlike CG, a very modest uh, think tank. Um, but, uh, but I would like to think kind of at the very uh, cutting edge of, of radical rethinking about economics and finance. Um, so with that, uh, let me get on to um, my presentation. This is really uh, the presentation about a paper that was just released, as, as was mentioned. Um, and, um, and I'd encourage you to read the paper. What I can say tonight is obviously only a, a small bit about the paper. Um, the next project I have in mind is to write a, a sequel to this, which is about regenerative finance. And so while I'll touch on finance tonight, um, I'm mostly talking about economic systems. And, um, and in the Q&A, obviously, I'd be happy to respond to questions that I'm sure people have about the current problems in finance and Wall Street. But, um, but what I intend to talk about tonight is really economic systems, because you can't really get to rethinking finance until you understand the economic system that finance needs to serve. And so, um, so that's why we're starting, starting here. So the first thing to say is that our economy is destroying the planet, the very basis of civilization, because there's a profit in it. And how we manage this issue will literally define our legacy on this earth. Welcome to the Anthropocene. The new ecological era where man's choices will literally determine the outcome for the entire planet. This is new, and we're messing it up. We live in a time of interconnected crises, economic, social, and ecological. They're systemic. If you're under 35, you intuit that capitalism, as we now know it, is in question. Your skepticism about whether or not our leaders are in control is well-founded. Most of them are lost, trapped in the old story of how capitalism is supposed to deliver prosperity. Yet if you are like me, you appreciate the many strengths of our free enterprise system. You're not interested in throwing that all away in search of some utopian dream that you know in your gut is naive, but you believe a better way is urgently needed. My hope is that the framework I'm calling regenerative capitalism will provide the vital roadmap we need to find that better way together. It provides the foundation for a new story, one that is aligned with how the universe actually works. And I'd like to pause for a minute and, and, and mention one uh, particularly important paper that I read that had a very profound impact on me. And that's a paper by Dana Meadows, who is the lead author of Limits to Growth. Uh, and it's called Leverage Points, Places to Intervene in a System. And she went through 10 uh, areas to intervene in a system, starting from the least important and ending to the most important. And the most important was the need to change the paradigm or the belief system or the story, the narrative within which the system exists. And I really took that to heart and chose to focus my effort of all the things we can do around climate change and sustainability and sustainable development. Um, uh, and there are, there are many. I chose this issue of, the, of redefining the paradigm because I believe all of the policy changes we need to make flow from our belief system about the way economics means, uh, is supposed to work. And so um, I'm going to be talking about this new story, this new paradigm, and, and the idea is that this is a critical leverage point from which all of the other changes we need to make should flow easier once we get this, um, this shift in thinking. So in this new story, everyone has a role to play, co-creating a pathway to the next stage of capitalism. And the stakes could not be higher. Many are already busy at work, often at the local level. We have documented some 25 regenerative stories in our field guide that you can find on our website. It's quite amazing and exciting, and it's also terrifying if we allow ourselves to think about the challenge. And today, or tonight, I'm going to talk about theory. Now, I'm a practical person. I'm a banker and investor by training, as you know, and I have no innate love for theoretical debates. But every once in a while, I believe, in a, uh, every once in a while, ideas and theories really matter. And at times of great change, like right now, new theories really matter. <clears throat> this shift in paradigm, our search for a new story, is way bigger than the age-old question of capitalism versus socialism, or free markets versus government regulation, 
or the story playing out in Europe about deficit spending versus austerity. This shift is about a new way to think, systems thinking. It may be as big as the Copernican shift. Copernicus, as you will remember, challenged the Earth-centric paradigm and offered his new theory that the Earth actually revolved around the sun and not the other way around. The Enlightenment was born. It was very threatening to the high priests of the church at the time. Scientific logic would usurp power from the church. And in a similar way, I believe thinking in systems, integral thinking, will revolutionize every field of study from medicine to management to urban planning to political governance and law, very relevant here at CG, and yes, most certainly to economics and finance. And this shift in thinking is equally threatening to our high priests, those who benefit most from maintaining the status quo. Most of them are good people trapped in a flawed paradigm. I often find that more, the more one has to lose, whether money or personal status, the less one can afford to see the consequences of our flawed system. But as the management guru and early systems thinker W. Edwards Deming once said, learning is not compulsory and neither is survival. Before we turn to this new story, uh, let us briefly confront reality head on. And I'm gonna be brief on this. I'm sure you're all very well versed in the issues of, of climate and ecological crises. This chart uh, kind of summarizes the whole thing, this concept that we're in overshoot, meaning we are, we are using more resources, uh, including the waste sinks of the planet, than it can regenerate on its own. And the people at the Footprint Network calculate that we're actually using 1.5 times the Earth's capacity to renew its natural resources. Think of that as a savings account Imagine the good old days when we earned interest on our savings account. And if you had you know, $100 in, in the bank and you were earning 5% interest or 10% interest, um, then you could spend $10 a, a year and not draw down your savings account. So this is the equivalent of us earning 10% interest a year but spending, um, uh, spending $15 a year. And obviously that's not sustainable. This is well known in the ecological uh, arena, but because we have this massive or, or stock of natural capital, the drawdown is happening slowly, so it's sort of a, um, a, a crisis happening in slow motion. Obviously, the weather events, uh, in, including this week in, in Texas, in Delhi, uh, and maybe even outside here tonight, um, are a reminder that, the, that things are moving and, um, and there are consequences to being in overshoot. Uh, this second chart looks at a very simple idea, which is that the, the story we've been told, the basis upon our economic paradigm, is that economic growth leads to prosperity. If you want prosperity, grow the economy. Well, it turns out that, um, and this is just one example, there are many research groups who have studied well-being, happiness, um, uh, a number of indicators that we would all agree are indicators of, of prosperity. It turns out that prosperity has decoupled from economic growth uh, back in the 70s. And we're, we're growing more and more at the level of GNP, but gaining less and less or, or literally no uh, incremental prosperity. What this doesn't show is all of the problems building up associated with that growth. So we have an economic paradigm that is fundamentally in crisis, and, um, uh, and the, only, the only tool we have is grow faster to create prosperity, and that's essentially what we're trying to do right now. But obviously that just exacerbates many of the other problems that we're dealing with. And then finally, and again, I don't need to tell you all or I won't dwell on it, but there are a number of social crises around the world. This is Greece, um, uh, but, but you know, we could put up many more pictures. And what these charts um, really just summarize is, is a far more complex web of interconnected micro and macro crises rooted <clears throat> to a large degree in broken economics. Even our terrorism uh, can be seen, at least in part, as a response to disempowerment that accompanies unhealthy or failed social, political, and economic networks. It's unsustainable. It can only be resolved through systemic shifts, not mere problem solving, which is our instinct. Otherwise, <clears throat> we are in a losing game of reacting to accelerating crises du jour which feels like exactly what's happening to me. The most important point I will make today is this.
For 500 years since the Enlightenment, we have perfected the skill of analytical problem solving. We break problems down, in, complicated problems, into their component parts. We optimize. But in doing so, we lose sight of the whole. That's when we get in trouble, and we're in trouble. Regenerative capitalism is not a new name for sustainable capitalism or other new economy ideas, green or otherwise, floating around. It is radical in the literal sense of getting to the root of the issue, in my opinion. It embraces all of these good efforts to transition our economy. It's not a competitive idea. And it represents huge challenges to business as usual. But anything less is simply not a credible response to the reality we face. I believe this integral or holistic approach is not only possible and practical, it is already emergent in the world today. And as Einstein understood, as Einstein understood, we need a new theory so we can see it. It's all around us, even if we don't fully recognize it yet. It's the difference between Western and Eastern medicine. The goal is integrated medicine, building on the best of both. In that sense, we're searching for an integrated economics and finance. We write about it in our field goal, in our field guide, and I've invested in it personally. It's very real, but still very fragile. It takes a new theory to help us see it and to know how to measure it empirically so we can manage it, and then we can scale it up. If we are to avoid a major systemic collapse, the leaders of tomorrow will need to think in systems. I bet my life on that. So what is a regenerative economy? The answer starts with a simple premise. There are universal principles and patterns that govern healthy, complex systems throughout the real world. Indeed, I've learned throughout the entire universe. They apply to living systems such as our bodies and entire ecosystems, but also to non-living systems such as the internet, for example. Human economies embedded in society are, neither, are, are another example of such complex systems. Our challenge is to bring our economics and finance into alignment with these universal principles and patterns. And when we do, we will have what I'm calling regenerative capitalism. <clears throat> I'd like to invite you to go to our field guide on our website where we have now 25 stories of projects that have tapped into this regenerative potential that exists all around, waiting for us to, to activate it. But remember this key point. These principles overlap and work as a pattern. It's not an a la carte menu that we can pick and choose from. Together they form a whole far greater than the sum of the parts. Like two molecules of hydrogen and one molecule of oxygen create water. We must learn to think and manage in patterns. And having said that, I'm now going to re re um, re resort to reductionist thinking and go through these in a list one at a time. So bear with me. The first principle is, um, about in, is in right relationship and the importance of relationships. Relationships are as important as the parts. How our muscles work with our nerves is a good example. Or a hand is five fingers, but it's also the space between five fingers and the relationship between our fingers that makes our hand functional. Collaboration, therefore, is smarter than competition. And as Janine Benyus, a uh, biomimicry expert, likes to say, life is a team sport. Stranded assets. This, this picture is um, probably familiar to you. This is the tar sands. Now, if we honor the principle of in-right relationship, that tells us that there is a known relationship between how much carbon the atmosphere can hold without tipping us into uh, out-of-control climate change. And we know that scientifically, and yet we continue to burn uh, fossil fuels, pushing us well past the, um, the acceptable threshold of carbon in the atmosphere. And the stranded assets problem is a huge challenge. I wrote a a blog on this several years ago where I estimated that the value of the, of the fossil fuel assets that we need to leave in the ground is $20 trillion. And our choice is burn the fossil fuels or destroy the planet. Now, $20 trillion is a big number. To put that into context, the subprime, the direct losses from the subprime crisis that triggered the last great recession were only $2.9 trillion. 
So we need, as a global economy, to absorb uh, approximately $20 trillion of write-offs, economic write-offs, if we're to avoid moving into catastrophic climate change. And that $20 trillion is not evenly spread around the planet. There are countries where fossil fuel uh, energy is, is a big portion of the total economy. Obviously, countries in the Middle East stand out, Venezuela, um, but obviously Canada has a particular issue to, to grapple with here as well. <clears throat> this is a, a view of in right relationship through the lens of a finance person. The way finance works is that finance sits on top, it sort of rules the economy, allocates capital, makes investment decisions. The economy is, is you know, the place that sources the resources it needs, whether it's human capital or natural capital uh, from the planet. And, and this is kind of the way the, the hierarchy looks. Now, um, any thoughtful person, kindergarten on, would look at that and say, there's something wrong here. And of course, uh, and by the way, that's my fancy slide from years ago, which I still use. I, I, uh, it's, always a, it's always a hit. I hope you enjoyed it, because it's the only fancy slide I have. Um, obviously, the, the relationship of finance uh, to the economy needs to be in service of an economy. An economy needs to be embedded in uh, culture, civilization, and the planet itself. So we in finance essentially have this all backwards, and we've built a paradigm that puts finance in charge of capital allocation decisions that determine the outcome um, uh, on this planet. Um, the the in-right relationship idea, I mean, I could talk about this all night. Um, it's, it's probably the most profound area that we need to think through. Uh, if you think about modern capital markets, and I'm a derivatives expert, or I was before I became old and out of date, um, but, but in derivatives, what we did is we broke down risks into their component parts, separated them, and managed them in their own buckets. And we, we, we then securitize assets and separate borrowers from lenders and bundle them into pools where we can manage them in discrete risk pools. All of this disconnecting the relationships between the end users, whether they're borrowers or investors or corporates and, um, and banks on the risk management side, and then we wonder why uh, the derivatives business and the securitization business was at the root of the, of the subprime mortgage crisis because we've disconnected all of these critical relationships. And if you happen to own a mortgage that was put into one of these pools, you can't even find the lender who you're trying to go renegotiate with because we've broken those bonds in the interest of more efficiency in, in capital markets. So we need to reconnect investors with enterprise we have ideas on how to do this uh, that you can find on our website, particularly uh, a project we call our Evergreen Direct Investment um, uh, Approach, which essentially would reconnect the real asset owners in the economy, the pension funds, uh, the sovereign wealth funds in particular, with real enterprises rather than having them disintermediated by the global capital markets. The second principle is uh, that we must view wealth holistically. Um, and there's a lot of work being done in this area already. There's the, the idea of multiple capitals um, is not a new concept. Uh, much work is being done in the form of the International Integrated Reporting Committee, the uh, Sustainability Accounting Standards Board in the United States, all part of this concept of integrated reporting pu and pushing for standards. Um, we try to measure, th this is actually a representation for some people in the permaculture community. You know, you can define the different forms of capital any way you like. I'm not saying these are the right ones or the only ones, but the point is that, that money is not wealth, and if we want to operate in a capitalist system, we need to manage all forms of capital, all forms of wealth, not just seek to optimize uh, financial capital, which is essentially the way the current system is set up. And secondly, optimizing shareholder value, which is what we teach in all of the leading business schools to this day, is clearly not aligned with this concept of, of viewing wealth holistically. And no wonder there's a move towards what's, what, what's being called stakeholder capitalism, which is the idea of, of honoring all stakeholders in an enterprise rather than just the, um, the financial investors. And this movement is evidenced by leaders like Patagonia who are putting this practice um, in, to work in the real world. And in fact, there's an entire movement that started in the United States and is now spreading around the world called B Corps. 
And B Corp is, you know, instead of a C Corp, which is the legal entity um, of, a, of a conventional corporation, a B Corp is, is a corporation where the, the charter expi explicitly requires the, um, the board of directors to consider the non-financial factors um, that matter to stakeholders, environmental, social, uh, et cetera. Um, so this, this idea of, of managing multiple capitals is, is alive and moving. <clears throat> the third principle, innovative, adaptive, and responsive. Entrepreneurship, unlocking the potential of human agency to create anew across all fields, is inherently regenerative. And few will question that innovation and adaptability are essential for, the health, <clears throat> for health in a rapidly changing environment. This town has direct experience with both innovation and the consequences of slow response and, and, to, and adaptation to change. The fourth principle is empowered participation. All parts must be empowered, all parts of a system must be empowered to negotiate their fair share in order that they can contribute to the health of the whole. So for example, your toes need the opportunity to negotiate within your circulatory system for enough oxygen in order for your feet to work and you to be a healthy human being. If that doesn't happen, you can't walk, you're not healthy. And it was fascinating to me in my study to learn that this concept of empowered participation is actually um, a well-understood principle, particularly in living systems, because it changes the whole, um, the whole debate about inequality. And we see great interest in alternative forms of ownership as a way to create empowered participation in enterprises. Um, for example, the, um, uh, the Mondragon uh, worker-owned co-ops in Spain represent over 12 billion euros in sales um, uh, across 250 businesses and accounting for 75,000 employees. And here in Canada, uh, Desjardins and Van City, we were talking at dinner, are cooperative businesses um, uh, that, that again are, are built on this principle of empowered participation of, of ownership. And I would even argue that conventional partnerships um, are, a, are a very attractive alternative form of ownership to corporations. You know, Goldman Sachs was a better private partnership than it is a public company. <clears throat> and this principle also applies um, and informs the quality circles in Japan that Dr. Deming um, uh, was famous for, for working on, dating back to the 1960s. And in fact, it goes all the way to the Greeks' invention of democracy and America's Bill of Rights. The concept of empowered participation extends beyond economics to our entire political structure. And as I mentioned before, it also changes the way we think about inequality. This is research done by the, um, the Equality Trust, and what it shows is um, uh, inequality across the right, high inequality on the right, which is bad, low inequality on the left, which is good. Um, and, a, and on the y-axis, it's an index of, of uh, health and social indicators. So things like obesity, um, suicide, uh, early teenage pregnancy, etc. cetera. And, and this aggregates, I think, 13 indices into one chart. And what it shows is that there's a fairly clear correlation between uh, within developed countries, this is all developed countries, there's a fairly high correlation between uh, low inequality um, and better health and, and social outcomes. And of course, the good old USA is all the way up on the upper right with the highest inequality and the worst index of uh, health and social problems. And this research has been replicated by others, um, and, and what it drives home is the fact that not only are you worse off if you're poor, but if you're, a, if you're rich, but in an unequal country, you're worse off than if you're less rich, but in a less unequal country, in terms of things that actually lead to, um, to, to well-being. And as I said, I, I believe this should change the nature of debate about inequality and, and make it uh, a more um, a practical uh, conversation as opposed to a, um, you know, an emotive and, and moralistic conversation. Now, I'm halfway through the eight principles. Um, I'd like to take a quick breather here um, and remind you what I said about these principles. Um, we need to see them as a pattern in relationship with each other, uh, together creating a whole that is far greater than the individual principles. 
like a group of instruments which are mere parts, cooperating together in right relationship becomes an orchestra with the previously unimagined potential of playing Mozart, a magnificent whole. Now, unfortunately, you have before you a former banker and not Mozart, so we're going to have to go back to the linear prose that is my only vehicle of communication and click through the, the next five or the next four uh, principles. The fifth one is honors community in place. <clears throat> um, and there's, there's tremendous interest in the United States and I suspect here in, in Canada about the concept of relocalizing local economies, the whole farmer's market movement. Uh, in the US, an organization started which is called BALI, which stands for Business Alliance for Local Living Economies. And it has spread across many cities in the United States. Um, this is in part a response to globalization gone too far, in my opinion. And we have a yearning to reconnect to community and to place, in right relationship, of course. And this principle creates a tension that all global enterprises must tackle head on, demands more intricate structure to ensure a connection to place if you're going to be a global enterprise. And I see a few clear conclusions. First, there are natural limits to globalization. It's not inevitable that we will continue to, to globalize further and further. In fact, there's evidence that um, businesses are actually returning to their place of home, uh, their, their home place of, of um, uh, you know, where they started, in part, I must admit, due to a shift in energy prices, but, um, but I, think, I think one of the realizations we will have is that in order to honor community in place, we're going to have to limit the expansion of, uh, of enterprises on, on a global scale. Um, and secondly, a conclusion to me is that economies of scale work real well for what's really wrong-headed efficiency but not very well for regenerative health where quality is more important than scale. <clears throat> the sixth principle, bear with me, uh, edge effect abundance. Oh, and, and by the way, here's a, here's a little philosophy from Wendell Berry. Um, he's always good for economy of words, getting right to the point. Um, the sixth principle is called edge effect abundance. This is a concept from ecology. In nature, life happens at the edges. So for example, at, at an estuary where a river meets an ocean, is a, where there's an abundance of life. Um, and we found in our field guide stories, uh, for example, in the story about the manufacturing renaissance in Chicago and in our Detroit Kitchen Connect project, that there's great creativity and opportunity, but also tension that arises at the edges. For example, the edges between the private sector, the public sector, and the education sector or across silos within the academy. But know this as well, edges are also where danger lurks. It takes courage to work on the edges. The seventh principle, uh, robust circulatory flow. Healthy circulation is fundamental for any system, living or non-living. And this applies to natural resources, materials, and energy, but also to information and money. All the important interest in closed loop circular economy, business models, and energy efficiency is further evidence of this principle already at work in the real world. But so too, Google's success as a company is derived from their unparalleled innovation accelerating the circulation of information. The efficiency driven consolidation of banking that's happened in the United States, coupled with the loss of ethics, has had a highly destructive impact on the healthy circulation of money to all levels of the economy. And this can be contrasted with one of our stories about the Bendigo, Bendigo Bank in Australia that has set up uh, joint venture partnerships in a bunch of communities that otherwise were unbanked. And they essentially set up a public um, or, or a partnership where the communities um, put up some capital and, um, and created a, a platform and the bank essentially served as the underwriting back office uh, for the bank, and they created these joint venture banks in these communities that otherwise would have no banks. And the deal was that the profits would be split 50-50 with the bank, and the 50% that stayed with the community got reinvested in the community. They've been doing this now for many years, and I believe over $40 million has been reinvested in these communities throughout Australia uh, through this business model. And that's an example of money circulating where it wouldn't naturally through innovative business models. And this obviously, this concept of robust circulatory flow has profound implications for governance. We should be promoting circulation, 
of materials, of energy, of information, and of money, rather than promoting um, undifferentiated economic growth. The final principle, drum roll, is uh, what I call imbalance. <clears throat> Balance is an ongoing process. And we know intuitively, and from our yoga instructors, that balance is vital. It turns out that this can be proven empirically in living systems. <clears throat> this chart is, um, is derived from the study of actual living systems in the real world by, um, by Bob Yulanowitz. Uh, and Sally Gorner, who's my colleague at Capital Institute, my science colleague. And what they've found, and they've been able to measure, is that resilient, or, or sorry, sustainable systems, healthy systems in the real world, balance a whole number of, um, of essentially opposing qualities. One being the quality of resilience and the quality of efficiency. And it turns out that, um, that, that, that in order for a system to remain in this window of vitality, um, you actually need it to be sh skewed slightly toward the resiliency side, but, but again, in this window of vitality, constantly seeking balance. Well, when I first saw this chart, it kind of blew my mind, because as a finance and economics person, I've been taught that the pursuit of efficiency is the goal of the system. And so what we had in the financial crisis is that the financial system and the economy moved way over to the right and became very brittle. In the pursuit of efficiency, we lost uh, resiliency, and the system essentially uh, cracked and, and, and collapsed. Now, there are many other um, qualities that need to remain in balance, like, for example, big, medium, and small. If you think about your own circulatory system, you have some big arteries, some medium-sized veins, and a whole bunch of small capillaries. And if your circulatory system is going to be functional, you need that balance of big, medium, and small. And that says something to, to how we should think about organizing the banking system. It's not that the big banks are bad and the little banks are good. We need both. But it also says that there's such a thing as, as a too big, a bank that's too big. Um, so my suggestion, bear with me a second. My suggestion is quite simple. We need to align our economy with these eight principles instead of the relentless pursuit at all costs of GDP growth and shareholder value. By doing so, we are more likely to achieve the outcomes we are looking for and generally would agree upon. They are the outcomes that only a healthy regenerative system can deliver. This is the international governance innovation we desperately need, I would suggest. To quote renowned urban, pl urban planner Jane Jacobs, who adapted uh, Toronto as her home, it's not how big you grow, it's how you grow big. So this slide um, is adapted from a chart that uh, a colleague, Bill Reed, created from his work at the Regenesis Group on, com on community development projects. Regenerative real estate development, even living buildings, are at the cutting edge of this regenerative thinking. And what this picture shows is that we, as we move from business as usual on the lower left, we head toward green, which is really less bad, but still unsustainable. And that's generally where we are collectively today. We're greening our economy. But less bad will not cut it. Only by aligning with the eight principles, all related in pattern, can we push above the line to restorative and finally to regenerative. And when we do, we will get sustainability as an outcome. When, <clears throat> when, like our bodies are sustainable because we are regenerating our cells on average every seven years. It's the regenerative process itself that is the key. Now, I've experienced this regenerative process in action in two of my private investment projects. One involves the holistic management of the grasslands. Our company, Grasslands LLC, is a partnership with the Savory Institute, a partnership. It utilizes a technique that mimics how buffalo roam in nature, enabling us to double stocking rates while healing the land in the process. And if you're interested to learn more about this, um, you can go to grasslands-llc.com or to the Savory Institute website. The other project involves regenerative real estate development, regenerating a degraded cornfield in one instance and a degraded forest in another 
while creating social and economic value in the process. In each instance, we enhance, and literally I mean it, we enhance ecological wealth, um, we enhance social wealth, and yes, economic value creation at the same time. It's actually quite beautiful, and it changes lives. There are, there are strong implications of all this for public policy. We need to get clear on these universal principles that are grounded in both scientific rigor and common sense. They are not political or ideological. They are real. Much work lies ahead in educating leaders in government, business, and finance from both sides of the political spectrum. Educating to think in systems, regenerative systems. This is not easy. It's a new way to think. System scientists are now developing metrics to measure these principles in real economies, including my colleague Sally Gorner. For example, we can measure circulation. We can measure system balance, as we've already seen. And we can measure, to some degree, non-financial wealth, as is being done already. I was in China recently, <clears throat> where Sanya City unveiled, unveiled the first natural capital balance sheet of any major municipal government in the world. So it's happening. Too slowly, but it's happening. We will also need to use non-analytical judgment, dare I say, wisdom. My friend Alan Savory likes to say we need high-tech solutions and low-tech solutions, and the low-tech solutions tend to be in the, in the category of wisdom. Our forgotten wisdom, both modern and indigenous, has never been more important. And of course, the implications of this regenerative framework for our modern finance, for the modern financial system, are profound. This will be the subject of the sequel to regenerative capitalism. It will tell us empirically what is a too big to fail bank and what a healthy financial system in service of the real economy should look like. The recent capital surplus penalty, meaning if you're really big, you have to hold more capital relative to your assets, for systemically important, meaning too big to fail, banks, is a fitting response in alignment with this regenerative thinking. So even in bank regulation, we're already moving in the right direction, although far too timidly. Real asset owners, like pension funds, need to reconnect in right relationship with real enterprises, as I said earlier, using methods like our evergreen direct investing in long-term resilient cash flows rather than in abstract speculation in stocks. Mark Wiseman, who leads the Canadian Pension Investment Board, is at the cutting edge of this approach already. Wise man, indeed. Warren Buffett has already thought this way about investment for his entire career. This new thinking creates an entirely new intermediation business model for Wall Street that is value added rather than extractive, the way mo so much of finance is today. We need a simple financial transaction tax that would restore some capital market resiliency, even at the expense of minor system efficiency. Again, think of that diagram. Recall the balance that is critical. The subsidy to debt from the deduction of interest expense for everything from McMansions in the United States to leverage buyouts and to hedge fund speculation makes no sense in the regenerative framework, and on and on and on. It may seem arrogant for a generation to presume we live in historic times, that this is a new Copernican moment. I've considered this a lot. What are the chances? I've come to believe that we do indeed live at a time of a once in 500 year shift in paradigms. And I'm not alone. I can relate to this quote from cultural historian Richard Tarnas about epiphany and about intuition running ahead of theory. Maybe you can too. We're in search of a new story, one that is aligned with our latest scientific understandings from quantum physics and new biology's understanding of the web of life. Everything is connected to everything in right relationship, and also aligned with our humanistic values and the core insights of the great wisdom traditions, Western, Eastern, indigenous, which are remarkably aligned with the new science, yet in conflict with our economics and finance. This new story is a shift from relying exclusively on reductionist problem solving to embrace holistic systems thinking, and this will be very hard. But we now understand the principles and patterns that describe all systems in the cosmos. This must be our new roadmap. 
and we're beginning to know how to measure them in the real world, often with surprising simplicity once we have the data. So we can learn to manage the system in alignment with the principles generating the outcomes we desire. I've attempted to illuminate them in eight principles and importantly their pattern of relationships with one another. All and more are vital for systemic health and we are only as healthy as our weakest link. Try running a marathon with a broken toe. Our governance challenge is to realign our economic system with these universal principles. Keep what works from conventional economics, but confront head on its many flawed assumptions. Money is not wealth. Exponential growth of material throughput in the economy, ever more resources into the system, ever more waste out of the system will end. Not all resources are substitutable with financial capital, like water, for example. And we'll never know the true price of externalities until it's too late. Climate change is not a mere externality or a market failure. It is a symptom of a flawed system. Nowhere will this shift be harder than in finance, trust me. It will require a newfound resolve and a shift in consciousness, really. I see this evidence uh, already all around us. The impact investment movement is probably the best example. Recently, the former governor of Massachusetts, Deval Patrick, went to work for Bain Capital to launch an impact investment fund. I wouldn't have guessed that five years ago. No doubt the shift in finance will require both carrots and sticks, and perhaps some clubs. Business as usual is not working. Our calling and our shared purpose, whether we like it or not, is to lead this historic shift to a regenerative civilization. I say that full well knowing the real world tension involved in needing to live in the world that is, while at the same time catalyzing the change to what is emerging. That's really tough. But as I said, life happens on the edges, and danger exists on the edges. My wish for you and for all of us is to summon the courage to dance on that edge. Our genius must be to dance on that edge. So my friends, we are the new Copernicans. Let's dance. Thank you. And I'd be happy to entertain questions or comments. Whoops. Wow. I think I broke the. <laughs> there we go. Anyone have a suggestion, comment? Sir. So uh, my name is, uh, is Robert Milligan. I uh, particularly appreciate your emphasis on integration of knowledge. Actually, the University of Waterloo has a Center for Knowledge Integration, and I happen to have been initiating catalyst uh, for that center. I heard about that today, actually. Ah, very yeah. good. So, in any event, um, you're, you're sort of moving to higher levels of conception, and I think there shouldn't be any limits here. So, you might want to consider going for, from uh, re regenerative uh, uh, capital to regenerative meta-capital. And when you get into beyond capital, I mean, capital is just a concept. So, so what analogous, at least, metaphorical forms can we explore there? The, the few businessmen are exploring, as is Roger Penrose in regards to theoretical physics, the whole concept of consciousness. Mm -hmm. The women's movement has talked about expanding our consciousness. There's evolving our consciousness, evol mm -hmm. you know, evolving, advancing, and so on our consciousness. We need to operate at a higher level of consciousness. Unfortunately, all of our systems out there, education, media, dampen, depress mm -hmm our consciousness, make us incapable people mm. of adequately dealing with all these integrated challenges. Mm. So we have to play at this higher level, this meta level, meta capital, mm. meta etc. So this is just a comment. Uh, no, I have no so I, I'd like to respond to it because it, it's a great comment. Um, you know, there, there is a thing now called conscious capitalism. Uh, and and I, I always try not to be critical of these things because they're well intended. Uh, I'm not convinced that at least some of the ideas being um, bantied about have come to grips with the real systemic crises that we're in. But one of the um, amazing um, realizations I had in studying what, what my colleague Sally Gorner calls energy flow networks is that they apply to consciousness. Consciousness is energy flow. 
And so these same principles apply to matter, you know, this floor. They apply to life, our bodies, living systems, um, non-living systems like the internet, as I mentioned, but all the way to consciousness. Now, when I give a talk, uh, I'm already talking pretty radically about rethinking how economies work. So I, I often don't delve into the consciousness piece of it, but there's a whole other layer above, and, and I am very interested in it. I, um, I don't pretend to understand it yet, um, but I do think, you know, my, my experience and, and why I'm standing here was a direct result of a shift in consciousness in me. And I sort of have an idea on why that happened and, and, and how that happened, but, but probably only part of an idea. And my experience with people in the sustainability world and business that are serious about it have also had a similar shift in consciousness. So I think there's a lot to what you're saying and it needs to be explored. Thank you very Thanks. much. There's a, there's a question on the machine that I'm able to read. Uh, if all parts of the system must be empowered, how can general local populations become more engaged in influencing economic systems? That's from uh, Janelle in Toronto. So um, that's a great question. And, um, and as I mentioned, the, probably the most um, uh, encouraging um, evidence that we have found that this regenerative system is emerging is happening at local levels. Uh, and, and there's sort of an unlimited amount of ways that we can engage at a local level um, uh, to do that. And, and, and often this starts with food. Um, we realize that we're putting toxic food in our bodies and in our children's bodies, and so we, we mobilize around food systems. And there are now food hubs happening around this country, or around our country, I'm sure, probably in, in Canada as well, where um, the idea is to make the logistics of getting food from the farm to either a grocery store or a restaurant or a house um, uh, more efficient, more, more effective. Um, so, so the first place I would start is food. Uh, the second place I would start is local energy. Um, you know, the, the entire utility industry in the world is undergoing profound uh, revolutionary change. As, you know, same thing that happened in the computer systems when we moved from centralized mainframe computers to distributed computing. And we're well on our way toward distributed energy, as, as many of you know. And so the first two places I would start would be food and energy. And, um, and, and of course, then there's the need to bring capital to local uh, to these initiatives, and there's, um, there's initiatives that, that have started in response to that. For example, Slow Money, uh, founded by my friend Woody Tash, is focused on bringing uh, some portion of capital back down to earth, as Woody likes to say, and financing local food initiatives. Um, and so, you know, you can find their organization on the website, and they now have chapters all around the country, and they're mobilizing people who have some savings to invest in a local farmer who needs a new tractor rather than to put your money in the stock market. And it's not to say you do that with all your money, but to consciously think about redirecting, recirculating your savings into your local economy. Um, so th there's lots of, of opportunities to do that. I would encourage people to, to check out Bali's website, B-A-L-L-E, -L -L -E, um, and also to read the field guide stories. Most of our stories are about local initiatives. In fact, my pressure on our team is to find big companies that are demonstrating these regenerative principles so that so that we prove to ourselves and to the world that this is happening not just in small-scale pilot projects at local levels, but also across big companies, and, and we're seeing that. Yes, sir. Uh, hi, I'm uh, uh, Dave Waverock. I'm a student of economics at the University of Waterloo. Uh, it's been pretty well understood for a long time that the incentives of different individuals to act in a certain way uh, don't necessarily correspond with the socially optimal outcome. Um, obviously, as a financial person, you would understand that better than most people, I would imagine. Um, you talk about the need for like the stick and the carrot and occasionally the club to change the way the things work. And I think that certainly using the club could be used in some situations, but we'd rather not use it in too many situations. Um, my question is essentially, what is the carrot? That is to say, um, how do you think we can change the incentive effects and the structures that are in place to uh, make people change their behaviors? How do you believe mm -hmm. that we can go about uh, affecting the change in a sort of liberal way? So that's an that's a easy one. <laughs> um, huh. So, you know, I, I have a friend who's on the board of a big, too big to fail bank, and um, 
and I confronted him with the um, fact that the CEO of Citibank and the CEO of J.P. Morgan um, jammed through on the, you know, right before midnight on the last day of Congress, this amendment to a bill that would essentially um, uh, degrade the derivatives regulation passed by Dodd-Frank. And it was a, a real, you know, you know uh, in the dark of night swoop in and, and it got in the bill and so now uh, it's very technical, I won't, I won't get into it, it doesn't really matter. The point is that it, it reduced some of the onerous regulation uh, on derivatives. Now, we could have a good debate about whether that particular regulation was a good or bad idea, um, but my point to my friend was if you encourage and reward the CEO, the two CEOs of two of the biggest banks in the world to play what I would call an unethical uh, political charade, uh, how do you expect the traders sitting on the foreign exchange floor who are manipulating the price of foreign exchange all day long uh, not to see that behavior and, and, and think that's what's encouraged? So, um, I, you know, I think the cultural challenge on Wall Street, and it's much worse on Wall Street than in the Canadian banks, is, is, is huge. And uh, it's very different than when I was in the business, I can assure you of that. Uh, I'm not saying when I was in the business it was all Boy Scouts, but something shifted uh, in, you know, after the, you know, it's basically leading up to the financial crisis. And amazingly to me, the financial crisis didn't wash it out. You know, the, the, the recent foreign exchange settlement where I, there's five banks now that are convicted felons. I mean, the thought that J.P. Morgan and Citibank and I forget the other banks are convicted felons and, and there are really no consequences other than they're convicted felons and they pay a big fine which comes out of the shareholder's pocket and it's tax deductible um, is, is, is astounding to me. So to try to answer your question, um, we, we need to create long-term incentives. That's number one. And, and, and we have ideas on how to do that. Um, it, it means moving away from this mark-to-market, -market, public capital market, everyone gets a bonus every year kind of paradigm. Um, and if you're interested, if you read our Evergreen Direct Investing um, paper, where we essentially are arguing that the incentives of both senior management of enterprises and of the financial intermediaries ought to be linked to the residual value of transforming enterprises through sustainability, changing business models to make them more sustainable. And if that's done well, there'll be value at the back end after the investors get their return, um, uh, which would cause everyone to think in very long term. You know, if you give someone a share of a company uh, that, that has value in year 10 and beyond, their behavior for the next 10 years changes radically compared to if you give them stock options, that gives them an incentive to jam the stock price up in the short term. So, you know, I, th I think we need to get clear on what we're trying to incentivize and then have the courage to, to make profound change. I don't know if that, that's not much of an answer, but it's part. Yes, sir. Yes, th thank you very much. You sold me. My, uh, my name's Nelson Jonat, and I teach at one of the local universities. And I just wondered how, you, and I, I should say, I, I'd like to call you the uh, Thomas Paine of your generation <laughs> with your common sense revolution. <laughs> but uh, I'd like to know I'll how... I'll take it. <laughs> how, how um, I'm thinking uh, at universities, and there's this need for profit all the time also, uh, how you would apply your system in the sense of, uh, I'm thinking of the liberal arts because they're considered not sustainable or not profitable. And I think of uh, Fareed Zechariah's a new book. Yeah, I just got it. And, and, I, and I, I haven't got it yet. <laughs> I haven't read it, but I just got it. And I'm thinking of how your system would apply to that. Yeah. And, and, and secondly, and I'll get out of here, the, the other thing I was thinking of, your system is great, it may take a while, there's lots of encouragement, but in the meantime, what do you, could you mm. comment on someone's idea like, uh, Piketty's, um, um, mm. the French economist, on, on capitalism in the 21st century of speeding things up that way. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so, so let me respond to the, the second point first. I, you know, yes, what I'm talking about is kind of a North Star vision that I believe we need to embed in people's minds as we think about um, the shorter term shifts we need to make. But don't confuse a long term vision with an absolute urgency to make some changes fast and now, for example, a carbon tax. I mean, if I, had, if I could wave my magic wand to do one thing, it would be implementing a stiff and accelerating carbon tax across 
all industries across the world enforceable. Um, if, if one buys into these principles, the need for a carbon tax becomes obvious. Um, so my hope is that by shifting people's thinking, it'll make the political likelihood of a carbon tax more, more likely. Um, but there's a whole lot of things. Um, the whole circular economy, energy efficiency, renewable, I mean, it's a long list of stuff. Um, Paul Hawkins coming up with a project called Project Drawdown, where he's got 100 things we need to do and can do now, um, and, and their impact on, on climate. So there's, there's a zillion things we need to do. There's no silver bullet. Um, uh, there's this expression someone gave me that there's, it's silver bu buckshot. There's like a lot of things we need to do, and we need to do them with great urgency. Um, my hope is that this new paradigm or a new story will help us make those decisions faster. Um, with res and, and, and well, Piketty's complicated, that's a whole complicated ball of wax. I'm not sure I want to uh, uh, tackle that one. Um, uh, other than to say that, that you know, well, I'll, I'll just leave it. Uh, it, it getting into the whole um, inequality issue uh, and what we do about it is a huge subject. I don't have any, you know, prescient answers to it other than I think if we reframe the debate out of the moralistic and political, I'm a free market believer or individualist believer or I'm a socialist, but look at it from a systems point of view, we know that extreme inequality will break down the system, so we need to fix it, um, is, is my opinion. In, in general, what I would say is it's easier to um, structure our economy so that extreme wealth doesn't happen in the first place, rather than to try to extract it after the wealth has been uh, created. Um, um, but that's a, that's a longer story. With respect to the liberal arts, um, you know, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a father of three, and I'm a big fan of the liberal arts, and, and I'm constantly wrestling with conversations with my kids and my friends about why I hold that position. Um, and I think, you know, one reason may be that you know, it'd be pretty hard to process what I just said without the curiosity that the liberal arts um, kind of teaches one. So, um, uh, but, I, but I don't know if it's direct, you know, other than that, I'm not sure it's directly, uh, directly related. Um, you know, in, in many ways, what's astounding to me is that our, our culture in the United States, and I think it's true in Canada, is in love with the sciences. You know, we honor the hard sciences and yet the hard sciences are in conflict with the way we run our economics. And, and so forget about consciousness and all this other you know, fluffy stuff, just the real hard sciences are in conflict with the way we manage our economics and, and why aren't we responding to that? It's, a, it's an amazing sort of sociological um, question. So there's a question for liberal arts. <laughs> Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, thank you. Um, great talk. I appreciate uh, you taking the time to come to Canada. <clears throat> um, we've inherited a economic system that relies very much on the price system to allocate resources effectively. Mm -hmm. And although I, I, you know, I intuitively have a sense that you're moving in the right direction here, I worry a little bit about the the normative versus the you know I guess the you know what is versus what should be question and how we move and I, I think you just spoke to it a little bit, advocating for a tax system on a number of different things. If I heard you right, um, how do we take advantage of what we've inherited as you know a fairly good system of resource allocation through the price system into a place where the flaws of that system are flushed out. And I have a follow-up. Um, the idea of disintermediation is a flaw in finance you mentioned, and it seems technology has at its base right now a concept of disintermediation as a good thing, and whether you think there's a paradox there somehow. Mm. And uh, finally, I agree with you. If you're not living on the edge, you're taking up space. So thank <laughs> you. Uh, let's see. Wait, what was your first question? <laughs> oh, the prices. All right, prices. Prices matter. And, I, and, and the problem with the price system as our means to allocate resources is that prices work in the very short term, um, but they are not very good at discounting long-term issues. So that's where policy has to come in. And, um, you know, I, I'm, uh, I'm always hesitant to talk about planning, but, um, you know, I just came back from China where they plan and they get stuff done. And, and so, um, 
you know, I, I think we've, we've sort of become enamored with this idea of our free market system and it'll just sort of magically through this invisible hand work its way out. Well, one thing we know is that doesn't work. Um, you know, we wouldn't be dealing with climate change if the price system actually worked for, de for dealing with issues that are long-term in nature. So we need some alternative mechanism. Uh, and I don't have it figured out. I don't think anyone has it figured out. Um, but my belief would be that um, if we organize ourselves around these principles, we're more likely to end up with answers that, um, that work for us. Um, that's not a very satisfactory answer, but I wouldn't want to suggest that the price mechanism, the market system is, 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 is not useful. It is. It's just a tool, and we need to know when and where to use the tool. Um, what was your second question? Oh, disintermediation. Yeah. So disintermediation. So, um, so that's another complicated one. And, and I guess what I would say is that we've become enamored with the efficiency of disintermediating and, and disaggregating all kinds of things. And that, well, let me just make this very personal. When I do private investing now, um, the first thing I think about is the relationship I have with the person I'm investing in or the fund I'm investing in. And if I don't have a relationship building or already built, um, I, I just stop. So it's my risk mitigation tool. It's much more useful than looking at correlations of stuff that doesn't matter, which is what finance generally does. Um, I, I do my risk management through relationship uh, building. And, um, and so I think, I think we've gone too far on all this disintermediation. Um, and, and the fact that pension funds own thousands of stocks, small positions in thousands of companies, um, but don't know and have very little influence on the management decisions being made in those companies is, is simply um, un, unworkable, particularly given the scale of the enterprises and the, the asset owners. You know, it's, it's all just, if we were playing with small companies and small amounts of money, the, the damage that could be done is relatively small. But, but there's, a, there's a responsibility that goes with managing $200 billion. Um, and, uh, and it's pretty scary to think that some of the biggest corporations in the world are effectively not owned by anyone because the owners are transient shareholders that don't really have much influence on the governance of these companies. So they're, they're effectively not owned um, by anybody. And that's just a, uh, that's a consequence, an unintended consequence of the public corporation that had many other good purposes, but I don't think the people that created public corporations ever thought that we'd have these you know, gigantic enterprises, including financial enterprises with a lot of leverage that have huge potential to bring down the global economy, as we've said, that are effectively not owned and not governed and, not, and no one responsible for them other than the management team who has massive incentives to take risk and earn short-term profits. Um, so anyway. That's, that's where I come out on that. Should I go back to the, the, uh, the online questions? So what role can global economic governance bodies such as the G20 play in shifting us into regenerative capitalism? Ah, uh, that's a great question. Um, so the first place to begin is to question whether the G20 and, and, and bodies like that, when they get together, have the bandwidth on their agenda to even think about this, right? And one of the reasons, you know, we all get sort of optimistic and pessimistic. We were talking over dinner, and, and one of the times when I get pessimistic is I think realistically, okay, John, you're gonna, get, you're gonna be given 20 minutes in front of the G20. What would I say? And, and, and of course, on their list of items is, you know, immigration, terrorism, you know, the Greek crisis, the dollar crisis, the, you know, uh, debt crisis, blah, blah, blah. It, it's, it's virtually impossible. Um, and so I think, I think what has to happen is that this needs to kind of build uh, at lower levels um, in, in government staffs. You know, there's a, there's a, um, uh, there's a, there's a very uh, capable guy at the Bank of England who, who is thinking about systems and working on financial regulation through a systems lens. And, um, and so it's better to find those people uh, in all areas of government, I think, and, and where you can sit down with them for an hour or three hours 
and have this conversation rather than uh, trying to go directly into the, the decision makers who, you know, God bless them, have a, an agenda that's already overwhelming and, um, and usually responding to very short-term issues. So I guess that would be my, my suggestion. Yes, sir. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, my first question is, do you see any common grounds between your theory and the, the, the basically the predictions that uh, the social movement of Occupy Wall Street and Zeitgeist predict? So is there like any uh, you know, common grounds between you mm. guys? And the second question is, where do you see capitalism is going? I mean, if for example, this shift took time to take place, do you see capitalism will not have any another Checkpoint. Thank you. Um, so I, I think I understand your question. On, on, the, on the first part of it, um, I actually went down to Occupy to kind of um, sort of see firsthand and experience what was going on. And um, I guess the way I would, the, the way I think about that is that that was a, so, so when, when you have, um, you know, every cause has an effect. You know, every, when there's pressure, it needs to be released. And, and so, to me, that was the release of some pressure uh, that is symptomatic of a system that is in some state of pre-collapse. And what actually happened there is less important than the fact that something manifested. You know, it was an earthquake, it, and, and, and it let go some pressure. But getting too um, caught up in what they wanted and what they didn't want and what they knew they wanted and didn't know they wanted and how they governed themselves, to me, is missing the point. The point is that, you know, for the first time in my life, a whole bunch of people that seemed like pretty radical people marched in the streets and occupied, you know, lower Manhattan for a while um, and caused people in power to be nervous. Uh, that's the first time that happened uh, probably since the Vietnam War uh, in the United States. Um, so, uh, so I just think of it, I think of it that way, and, and, and maybe it was just a, an early quake and it's gone and by and, it, and, and you know, the next thing that comes up will be radically different than that. Um, but where, where this sort of says capitalism is leading, you know, I, I don't think, so there's a, there's a new economy movement now that's building and there's lots of people with lots of ideas on, on, on alternative paths forward. What, what I know is that um, we have to invest $40 trillion in an energy transition if we're going to have a chance to deal with climate change and live anywhere near the kind of standard of living we're accustomed to living. And I know $40 trillion doesn't get invested without capital being accumulated and deployed at risk. And so there's a reason we need a capitalist system now more than ever. The problem is that it's broken. And we're investing in short-term hedge fund speculation rather than in energy grids. Um, but to me, the thought of making this transition without a capitalist component to the system uh, is, just, is just completely un unrealistic. Um, but where, where it goes and what it looks like 25 years from now, you know, your guess is as, as good as mine. I, I think if, if, um, if we knew the answer to that, we'd be working our way to get there. But, but systems evolve in ways, and, and you know, Tad and others here know way more about this than I, but they evolve in ways that are unpredictable. And so um, I, think, I think what we know is that we better not think we can predict the future. Uh, and that's to me why by getting clear on, on, on core principles is important. Because if we know the core principles work in living sustainable systems and non-living systems, you know, I'll, I'll throw my hat in that boat and, and ride the storm rather than you know, some fancy theory that comes up in someone's brain. And, and by the way, you, know, you mentioned this is my theory. This is not my theory. This is my study of what the science says. Um, I'm just trying to apply it to economics on a broad scale. And so my, my bet is you know, let's, let's align with those principles and ride through the storm rather than think we're smarter than, than you know, four billion years of experience. Yes. Hi, my name is Jennifer Ross. I'm not affiliated with any university whatsoever. Good for you. <laughs> um, I really like your talk, and um, I first want to say that I was surprised to discover that um, finance people thought they were above the planet. I didn't know they actually really <laughs> thought that. Um, okay. <laughs> um, 
Well, I should, I should clarify that in, in deference to my friends in finance. What, what I really mean is that they view the economy through the lens of finance drives the system, yeah. we allocate capital, and that the planet, you know, I may hike and love nature, but the planet gets translated into natural resources I need for my economy and human resources I need for my companies. And, and it's, so it's sort of a, a non, an unconscious yeah. ordering, not a conscious oh, ordering. Maybe. How's that? <laughs> um, you talk about um, sticks and clubs, and you talk about the eight principles, many of which um, are familiar to me from another thing. So I wanted to ask you, what do you think about proportional representation as a method of limiting the power struggle from the government where we could maybe have people not buy into this um, Citibank and JP um, and mm. change the laws at the last possible minute because they don't have mm. the power. Yeah. So you mean democracy? <laughs> That's the one, yeah. <laughs> democracy was a pretty good idea. Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, the, the, the so, so w what I would say is that these principles apply directly to how we think about governance. And as I mentioned in the talk even, they, they inform the, the whole idea of democracy. Um, th these are principles that go way back to Plato. And, and so um, there's a reason why we think democracy is a good idea. And, and unfortunately, um, the human experience, to my knowledge, and some of you will know this history better than I, but whenever we've created uh, successful civilizations, they sort of morph into some form of oligarchy. And, um, and so we haven't figured out as a, as a civilization how to hold healthy hierarchies, right? We, we, we kind of know intuitively we need some hierarchy to organize. Um, and, and systems are organized in hierarchies. Um, but every time we in human civilization have had a hierarchy, it's become corrupt. Uh, and that's true uh, of the Greeks, the Romans, uh, the church. Uh, and I would argue now there's sort of a corporate oligarchy. Um, and that's probably our hardest challenge is to figure out how to govern ourselves in a healthy, you know, it's the servant leadership you know, the lion in, in, in the jungle spends most of his time sleeping. And, you know, our lions don't spend their time sleeping. Um, and how we convince our lions to sleep more in service of the system is, is, is a huge challenge. Uh, I don't have an answer for that. So you, um, I was wondering specifically your impression of proportional representation as an electoral system? You know, I don't know enough about it to give you a, a thoughtful comment. Um, so why not, I, I, I'll leave it at that. Okay. I'm intrigued with it, um, but I don't know enough about it. My friend, yes. more consciousness. Yes, <laughs> but not necessarily fluffy. <laughs> so uh, I, I think that, that term suggests this is an area in which some people hesitate to play. But let me emphasize, as I said before, Sir Roger Penrose, uh, the main teacher of Stephen Hawking, mm -hmm. and on the board of the Primer Institute here for some, some period, mm -hmm. felt it needed to be part of the theoretical physics paradigm so it could become a, a better explanatory means. And his colleagues, maybe they thought in terms of fluffy consciousness, mm -hmm. but they have resisted him and thrown rocks at him. And just one other comment with respect to the liberal arts, it could contribute to the advancement of our consciousness. But the way it's structured, so it's not integrated, yeah. okay? So often it's unnecessarily obscure. Uh, few people take it to, to the level they like, and even bright people in first university, year university, particularly a lot of them with, with Shakespeare, they find that the way it's expressed, mm -hmm. the way it's taught, it, it just doesn't give them what it could potentially give yeah. them. So uh, the whole area of the arts can make a contribution, but it has to be reinvented, integrated, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And I don't see a big movement in that direction. Yeah. Well, and, and, and you know, I, I've gotten to know uh, Nora Bateson, who's Gregory Bateson's daughter, and, and um, she's got some very interesting ideas on 
how to, um, how to communicate these ideas uh, using the art. So uh, it may be that you know, a list of eight principles that a former banker ticks through, bing, 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 is just not going to cut it in terms of the communication of these ideas, even if they're you know, roughly correct. Um, so I, I, I'm in full agreement. Thank you. And I didn't mean to call it fluffy. <laughs> it was a slip of the tongue. Any, any final questions? Well, thanks very much. You've been a, a great audience. I appreciate your time and attention. Uh, a few quick comments before we adjourn. I have a couple of thank yous. Uh, first of all, I want to thank our own uh, Tad Homer Dixon for inviting John Fullerton to come here uh, uh, to Canada uh, to give this talk. And then especially, of course, I want to thank you, John Fullerton, for your lecture this evening. Um, you noted at the outset that learning is not compulsory. Um, so I was, I'm always interested to see that so many people come out voluntarily to learn about uh, difficult concepts or, or cutting edge concepts here at the uh, CG Auditorium and those who join us on our webcasts and uh, the many who will view the video of this, uh, this uh, address this evening. Uh, those are hundreds of people combined from this one event who are voluntarily learning about the principles of regenerative capitalism and I'm sure that in the work of the Capital Institute you're reaching many thousands. Um, so when you say you're not alone, I believe that's true. Uh, these are themes that we also hear from other speakers increasingly in our lecture series about, um, you know, the way you put it is uh, finding right relationships in the economy, empowered participation, uh, balance between resilience and efficiency. I think these are ideas are gaining traction in many spheres. Uh, so for sharing uh, your own epiphany and, and the wisdom that you've acquired in this area, and for helping to shift our consciousness. Uh, we thank you very much again. The edited, edited video, as I mentioned, will be posted to the CG website, for, so watch for that in the coming days. And as we near the end of this season of CG uh, public programming, we invite you to join us for the last two events of the 2014-15 year. On June 8th, we'll be screening the documentary Red Lines. You saw the trailer at the beginning of this event. The movie follows two young Syrian activists who launch a plan for bringing democracy to Syria. And then finally, we invite you to join us on June 17th for our annual media panel, uh, co-sponsored by the Waterloo branch of the Canadian International Council. This year, we'll hear about the need for Canadian reporters' eyes on foreign news. From top news executives of some of Canada's most influential media, the Globe and Mail, the CBC, CTV, and the Toronto Star. Be sure to register online for our uh, CG Events newsletter to learn about these and other events. And uh, thank you for coming this evening. Have a safe journey home. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the Center for International Governance Innovation, or CG as we say. My name is Fred Kuntz, I'm the Vice President of Public Affairs here at CG. I'd like to thank our public event sponsor, Wordsworth Books, for their ongoing support of the CG Signature Lecture Series. Thanks also to you for joining us at this event, whether you're here as part of the live audience or if you're watching online through the live webcast. Following this evening's address, we welcome questions from both audiences at the microphones here at the front of the auditorium or through the live chat function on your screen if you're watching at home. Please remember to state your name and to keep the questions brief. Now, there are people who accept trends and there are people who direct them. Those are the innovators. And just last month, the Capital Institute, a think tank based in Connecticut, released a paper called Regenerative Capitalism, How Universal Principles and Patterns Will Shape Our New Economy. The paper investigates how the unsustainable capitalism of today can be turned into a network of regenerative economies that contribute to the overall health of the world economy. Tonight, founder and president of the Capital Institute, John Fullerton, will speak to us about this imagined, reimagined capitalism. And here to more properly introduce tonight's speaker is CG Senior Fellow Olaf Weber. Olaf joined CG's Global Economy Program in March of this year. He's an Associate Professor and Program Director in the University of Waterloo School of Environment, Enterprise and Development. So please join me in now in welcoming Olaf Weber.
Thank you, Fred, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm more than happy to introduce John Fullerton today, the founder of and president of Capital Institute. I think John is an ec economy thought leader and public speaker. He is also an active impact investor uh, through his level three capital advisors, and I'm sure that he will explain what impact investing is. Um, amongst others, he's investing in, in a sustainable bank, in sustainable farming, water management, and so on. Uh, previously, he was a managing director of JP Morgan, where he managed multiple capital market and derivatives business around the globe and ran the venture investment activity of Lab Morgan as a chief investment officer. Furthermore, and in, in recent times, he is a co founder and director of Grasslands LLC, a holistic ranch management company, a director of New Day Farms, New Economy Act Coalition. Savoy Institute and an advisor to Armonia and, and Richard Branson's business leader in initiative B team. And recently he became a full member of the Club of Rome. John is the creator of the Future Finance blog at capitalinstitute.org, which is also syndicated with The Guardian, Huffington Post, CSR Wire, and other well-known publishers. He has appeared on Frontline, has been interviewed by New York Times, Bloomberg, Wall Street Journals, and many more. John has an MBA in finance from Stern School at New York University and a BA in economics from the University of Michigan. As Fred mentioned, John will speak about reimagining capitalism. He's calling for a shift to the next states of capitalism that operates from a deeper mission than mere financial profitability. The new goal is promoting the long-term health, the well-being of our human communities, and the planet. I would say sustainable development. In, in his presentation, John will explore the eight key principles of a regenerative economy and will share solutions with us that are currently being applied um, by real world businesses. I'm looking forward to hear more about regenerating capitalism and the new role, especially of the financial sector. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming our speaker, John Fullerton. Good evening, and thank you, Olaf, uh, for that introduction. And um, in particular, I wanted to, to thank CG for this opportunity, and, and in particular to Tad for, uh, for making this happen. Um, I met Tad several years ago at an INET conference, which was actually, I believe, when INET and CG first forged a partnership. So uh, while this is my first time at CG and my first time in, in Waterloo, I sort of feel connected to, um, uh, to what you're doing here. You know, the, um, uh, well, actually, I have to comment on the, the, the preview. I, I sort of felt like we should be passing out popcorn. It was quite, a, uh, quite, a, uh, quite an opening. Um, I came into town um, just yesterday and staying at the hotel across the street and noticed the, all of the construction happening. And, um, and really, it, it reminded me of a recent trip I made to China. And so, uh, with all the construction and high rises and cranes, uh, Waterloo, while not that well known in the United States, must be a, a booming, a booming town. And, and uh, so, at any rate, it's it's great to be with you all tonight. You know, I kind of stumbled into this question um, of of how to rethink capitalism, really somewhat by accident. Um, and, and I thought I'd take you back a little bit to my former life at J.P. Morgan. Uh, and I always like to say in, in meetings like this, it was really the old J.P. Morgan that I worked for. I, I went there right out of college in 1982. The bank was then called Morgan Guarantee Trust Company, which is a very prestigious bank, um, high ethical standards, and, um, and, and quite different than the J.P. Morgan we know to, today in, in many ways, um, mostly the scale of, of the firm. And I worked there very happily for 18 years. Uh, I have to put it out on the table. I was a derivatives professional in the early days of derivatives. Uh, back in the 80s, I was the first uh, head of, I, was, I, was, I moved to Tokyo when the first yen interest rate swap happened on planet Earth. And uh, going to Tokyo to do work in swaps when that happens is, is sort of fortuitous timing. And so I really rode the wave of uh, derivatives revolutionizing uh, global capital markets for the next 10, 12 years of my career. And then I kind of got tired of the markets and the um, increasingly 
sort of highly competitive nature of capital markets. The creativity had, had largely been gone, I thought. Um, and uh, so I wanted to learn how to invest capital. So I moved into our private investment group called Morgan Capital and, um, and basically stayed there until the merger with Chase, uh, investing money on behalf of the bank in early stage companies. Uh, and when the merger with Chase happened, it was kind of my excuse to walk away. I had been growing increasingly restless, but I had been involved in this idea of impact investing. Uh, the first investment I made for the bank was in, the, uh, in a company called Edison Schools, which was a charter school management company. So I had this idea of aligning capital with social purpose back in 1997, long before uh, this concept of impact investing happened. Um, but but things were moving fast on Wall Street and the, the, the culture of the firm that I kind of grew up in and learned to love was already fading in the face of highly competitive capital markets. Um, and with the merger with Chase, it became clear that the Chase culture was gonna dominate um, the, the new Morgan. You know, Chase kept the name Morgan, but the reality was that they bought the bank. And so um, I, cho I chose that opportunity to leave with no real plan on on where to head, and no knowledge of the ecological crises that we're now uh, wrestling with. And I took the summer off. Uh, my first day back downtown after taking the summer off, I was going to visit a, a um, CEO of a charter school management company. I was thinking about getting involved further in that area. And it was a beautiful fall day. Uh, I was riding down the subway. I had a 9.30 meeting downtown. And at, at City Hall, which is where uh, the Brooklyn Bridge comes in, if you're familiar with Lower Manhattan. Uh, this guy comes in the subway, and I can still visualize his picture like it happened yesterday, and he, he announced to us in the train, they just flew a pla plane into the Trade Center. And so I left and went up to the street, and the second plane had just hit, and I stood there for probably a half hour trying to figure out what was happening and what I might be able to do, and then I decided I better get home, and it took me the rest of the day to get home, and when I got home, I, have, I had three, what were then quite young children, and I remember, again, very viscerally looking them in the eye and not knowing how to explain to them the world that they were going to grow up in. So I think that the combination of having some free time and that experience pushed me into a fairly deep think period in my life, and I started reading books, and I started learning about the environmental crisis in a way that I had previously no appreciation, no knowledge. Um, and I read Limits to Growth, and I read E.F. Schumacher and Herman Daly, and, um, and it was sort of this rolling epiphany that I realized that it was the economic system that was the root cause of the ecological crisis, and now it's quite apparent that the, ecological syst or that the economic system is also at the root of our many social crises. And as a finance person, it became very clear to me that since finance drives economics and the economy, it was finance that was at the root of many of these interconnected systemic crises. And that, as you can imagine, um, causes one some pause. And, um, and so I, I chose to sort of pour myself into this question of how to rethink the economy. Um, and it was only really after the financial crisis that I had the confidence to launch Capital Institute, which is, unlike CG, a very modest uh, think tank, um, but, uh, but I would like to think kind of at the very uh, cutting edge of, of radical rethinking about economics and finance. Um, so with that, uh, let me get on to um, my presentation. This is really uh, the presentation about a paper that was just released, as, as was mentioned. Um, and, um, and I'd encourage you to read the paper. What I can say tonight is obviously only a, a small bit about the paper. Um, the next project I have in mind is to write a, a sequel to this, which is about regenerative finance. And so while I'll touch on finance tonight, um, I'm mostly talking about economic systems. And, um, and in the q and obviously, I'd be happy to respond to questions that I'm sure people have about the current problems in finance and Wall Street. But, um, but what I intend to talk about tonight is really economic systems, because you can't really get to rethinking finance until you understand the economic system that finance needs to serve. And so, um, so that's why we're starting, starting here. So the first thing to say is that our economy is destroying the planet, the very basis of civilization, because there's a profit in it. And how we manage this issue will literally define our legacy on this earth. Welcome to the Anthropocene. The new ecological era 
where man's choices will literally determine the outcome for the entire planet. This is new, and we're messing it up. We live in a time of interconnected crises, economic, social, and ecological. They're systemic. If you're under 35, you intuit that capitalism, as we now know it, is in question. Your skepticism about whether or not our leaders are in control is well-founded. Most of them are lost, trapped in the old story of how capitalism is supposed to deliver prosperity. Yet if you are like me, you appreciate the many strengths of our free enterprise system. You're not interested in throwing that all away in search of some utopian dream that you know in your gut is naive, but you believe a better way is urgently needed. My hope is that the framework I'm calling regenerative capitalism will provide the vital roadmap we need to find that better way together. It provides the foundation for a new story, one that is aligned with how the universe actually works. And I'd like to pause for a minute and, and, and mention one uh, particularly important paper that I read that had a very profound impact on me. And that's a paper by Dana Meadows, who is the lead author of Limits to Growth. Uh, and it's called Leverage Points, Places to Intervene in a System. And she went through 10 uh, areas to intervene in a system, starting from the least important and ending to the most important. And the most important was the need to change the paradigm or the belief system or the story, the narrative within which the system exists. And I really took that to heart and chose to focus my effort of all the things we can do around climate change and sustainability and sustainable development, um, uh, and there are, there are many, I chose this issue of, the, of redefining the paradigm because I believe all of the policy changes we need to make flow from our belief system about the way economics means is supposed to work. And so um, I'm going to be talking about this new story, this new paradigm, and, and the idea is that this is a critical leverage point from which all of the other changes we need to make should flow easier once we get this, um, this shift in thinking. So in this new story, everyone has a role to play, co-creating a pathway to the next stage of capitalism. And the stakes could not be higher. Many are already busy at work, often at the local level. We have documented some 25 regenerative stories in our field guide that you can find on our website. It's quite amazing and exciting, and it's also terrifying if we allow ourselves to think about the challenge. And today, or tonight, I'm going to talk about theory. Now, I'm a practical person. I'm a banker and investor by training, as you know, and I have no innate love for theoretical debates. But every once in a while, I believe, in a, uh, every once in a while, ideas and theories really matter. And at times of great change, like right now, new theories really matter. 